We return this morning to our study of Abram, who becomes in this chapter renamed Abraham in chapter 17 of Genesis. If you would bear with me as I read again a portion of this Scripture, beginning in verse 1. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am Almighty God, walk before me and be blameless. And I will make my covenant between me and you and will multiply you exceedingly. Then Abram fell on his face. And God talked with him saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you and you shall be a father of many nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful and I will make nations of you and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you and their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your descendants after you. Also, I will give to you and your descendants after you the land into which you are a stranger. You would go down to verse 9. And God said to Abraham, As for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you, throughout their generations. This is my covenant which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you. Every male child among you shall be circumcised. If you would go down to verse 18. And Abraham said to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. Then God said, No, Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant with his descendants after him. Last week we talked about concerning this text that God has made it clear in verse 1 as He again reveals Himself to Abraham, that He is the Almighty God. And He says, walk before Me and be blameless. This covenant that God is making with this man Abraham is established, it is guaranteed in this chapter, first of all, It is sealed, it is guaranteed to Abraham by this revelation. And this is the reason that God tells Abraham what He tells him in verse 1. He wants him to understand the covenant will come to pass and the blessing which I have declared to be yours will be made sure. It is guaranteed, Abraham, not based on who you are, but it's based on who I am as God. I am Almighty God. Abraham, I can do anything. There is nothing that is outside the limits of my control or my ability. You know what a message that has for us today as God's people. There is absolutely nothing that is beyond God's control. He is sovereign. He is omnipotent, meaning He has all power. And as the word means, the the name that He gives to Abram here, He is El Shaddai in the Hebrew, meaning... The all-sufficient one. Folks, there is no situation that we can get ourselves into that God cannot, in which God cannot take care of us. There is, there is nothing that can happen to you that God cannot meet you there and take care of you. There is, there is no position that you can get yourself into that God will not be there to meet you, to help you. God has all power and all ability to help us. There is no sin that can conquer you. We read that in Romans this morning. Read Romans chapter 8. It is clear. Paul says the power of sin has been broken through Christ Jesus our Lord in His crucifixion. He has nailed our sin to the cross. It has no power over our lives. What is it that you deal with? God can deal with it. He can defeat it. He can make you an overcomer through whatever situation you face whether it be difficulty in the marriage, if it's difficulty on the job, difficulty at school, difficulty with sin, 
Whatever it is, God has all ability to overcome that in your life, as God in your life. You're not a victim. We live in a victim society today. Everybody's a victim. The Bible says we are overcomers through Christ Jesus our Lord. We are not victims. And God has guaranteed to us in the Scripture that we are able to deal with all things and all situations, folks, through faith as we trust Him and do it His way. Do not put limits on God. People spend their lives putting limits on what God can do. God can do all things through... And He says to us in Philippians, I can do all things through Christ Jesus my Lord who strengthens me. There is nothing that God calls me to do that I cannot do. God can do all things through me and in my life. Jesus said as well to us folks, He said, I can. No. He said, I will build my church. And He will build us as we walk by faith. We can't do it. We will never do it. We will never build up ourselves as Christians, nor will we build His church. We can play like we're going to do it, and it can look good on the outside, but only Christ can build His church. The second way in which He confirms and establishes and seals, if you will, this covenant, is by the name change that He gives to Abraham. He was Abram, meaning High Father. But he changes his name. And whenever God changes the name of a person, he is changing the character of that person. And God comes to Abram, Abram, excuse me, and he changes his name to Abraham from high father to father of a multitude. Now, folks, this is an amazing thing. And this all goes back to the issue of faith. Because God is telling Abram, before he is a father, that he is a father of a multitude. In God's eyes, and in God's economy, he's already father of a multitude. We are already receiving, if we will do it by faith, the blessings of God. All of them are available to us in God's economy and in God's eyes. They're all here for us. If we will ask for them and, and trust Him by faith, they're all ours. It's already a reality. But we're like, we're like somebody trying to cap an artesian well or trying to cap a, a great fountain of, of God's blessing. We're always trying to cap it saying, this can't be, this can't be. It already is. It's already a reality. God has said to Abraham, you are the father of a multitude. Now I can imagine... Folks, in reality, in his life, just as it is today, people make fun of Christianity. I'm sure they made fun of Abraham. Can you imagine? In his day, it was required. It was the custom when people came through uh, uh, your area. They passed Abram. He was a man of wealth and means. It was his responsibility to open his door of hospitality to them. As they came by, came by with a caravan, I, I'm sure that you know, people would come by and they would meet Abraham. I'm sure they asked each other, well, what's your name? And I know, you know, cultures are different, but everybody has to know what everybody's name is. What's your name? Well, my name is Abraham. Well, everybody knows what those names meant in those days, that you didn't have names just because they sounded good. You had names based on your character. That's the way they named people in those days. We don't do that anymore. I'm sure that as, as they met Abram or Abraham, they may have said, Father of a multitude, where are the children? Where are they at? Uh, where, where are all those children? And Abraham would have said, don't have any yet. But my name is Abraham, father of a multitude. You see, you just didn't do that in those days. But God did it. God did it to illustrate a point. It is going to happen. It already has happened. And this is what God was doing. And He's confirming. He's making it sure. He's telling Abram, it's already happened. I'm changing your name now. I know you don't have a son yet. But it's going to happen. It is a literal, in man's eyes, impossibility. 
Abraham, we've read in this text, he says, when Abram was 99 years old and his wife was about this age as well. It's supposed to be physically impossible for them to have children. But God says, I don't care about physical impossibilities. All things are possible with God. And so God tells Abram, it's going to happen. I'm changing your name now as a guarantee. You will know that it will happen. Now, Abram had a problem with this in that he said, Oh Lord, let my son Ishmael live before you. Let him be the one that receives this blessing. That he is the one through which you will build your kingdom. And through which will come, by the way, the Redeemer. God says, no. That was your plan. I know you love Ishmael. But that's not my plan. Folks, there is great lesson for us in this because as the church and as God's people, so often we want to do it our way. And it can't be done our way. It must be done God's way. God's way is the way of faith. The way of Ishmael is you use what you've got. You use what's here. You use the person that's here. Doesn't matter whether they're qualified or not. We do that in the church all the time. We don't want to exercise faith. We'd rather do it our way. We'd rather do what is physically possible. God says, no, I want you to do what's physically impossible. You're having a son by your wife, Sarah. Yes, it's physically impossible, but I'm going to do it anyway. As we look at the church and in our own individual lives, there are many things that God wants us to do that are absolutely impossible. The only way that it can be done is through faith. And that's what God wants. I want you to understand also, thirdly, that this covenant was sealed by circumcision. Circumcision, of course, being the cutting away of the flesh of the male reproductive organ. Circumcision was a sign, a token of this covenant. It was a seal of righteousness attained by faith. Folks, never forget that God justified Abram by faith, not by circumcision. He was justified by faith already. And we have to understand that our salvation is a relationship between ourselves and God, a relationship of faith. It's not going to church. It's not being baptized. It's not being a church member. It's none of those things. It is a personal relationship of faith with God. That sign that God gave Abram or Abraham was a sign of obedience to Him in all matters. Just as baptism is also. They're not the same, but baptism is a sign of obedience. It is the first step of obedience. And if a man comes to Christ and says, yes, I want to be a Christian, and yes, I want God in my life, if he's unwilling to be baptized, he's saying to the church and to the world, I'm not willing to commit. You might feel emotional about God. You may have salvation, but that salvation has to be confirmed through obedience. Faith always obeys. I want you to understand also that this was a sign of belonging to God's covenant people. Once a person was circumcised, you can't go back. Once you've changed your flesh, once you've cut away the foreskin, you're always going to look that way. You can't, you can't change it. You're committed. It's done. And it's a sign to everybody around you. This is what it was. It was a sign. I am God's covenant people. I am with God's covenant people, the Jew, the Hebrew. No one could ever look at you and say, you're not a Hebrew. No, you're, you, you've been sealed by that covenant. It is a commitment with which you could not go back. You, 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 you're now committed. You're circumcised. And you know, folks, I have to say the great fault of so many Christians is that, is that we have never 
really committed. That is what we need as God's people. Commitment. I read a wonderful story this week when, uh, of uh, Pavarotti. He says, when, when, when I was a boy, my father, a baker, introduced me to the wonders of song. Tenor Luciano Pavarotti relates. He urged me to work very hard to develop my voice. His father, and I think I'm pronouncing this correct, Erego Pola, a professional tenor in my hometown of Moderna, Italy, took me as a pupil. I also enrolled in a teacher's college. On graduating, I asked my father, shall I be a teacher or a singer? Luciano, my father, replied, if you try to sit in two chairs, you will fall between them. For life, you must choose one chair. I choose one. I took seven years of study and frustration before I made my first professional appearance. It took another seven to reach the Metropolitan Opera. And now, I think whether it's laying bricks, writing a book, whatever we choose, we should give ourselves to it. Commitment is the key. Choose one chair. And folks, that's what we need to do. As God's people make up our minds, am I going to serve God? Or am I going to choose the world? And the great difficulty with so many people is that we can't make up our minds what we want to do. We want to enjoy the pleasures of the world and have the security of salvation at the same time. God says, oh, uh. no, you make up your mind. You choose one or the other. It's a marriage. It's a contract. You see, I can't go to my wife and say, you know, I love you, baby, but I, there's some women out there that I'd really like to have. Essentially, that's what we do very often as Christians. Oh, God, I love you, but I want these other things too. God says, no, make up your mind. Make up your mind. We had a doctor in, uh, in, in Charlotte that, that I was very, that uh, greatly impressed me, Dr. Gurley. who sat down with us before Janice had her first child, and he began to share with us his faith and his faith in Christ. And he actually had prayer with us before we had, before we went into the procedure to to have our first, our first child, which was Allison. And, and made it clear, he said, I'm a Christian. He said, and he said, I will never forget these words. He said, I make it clear to everybody that I work with. I am a Christian. He says, that way there's no mistake. He says, that that way there's no compromise. They will never ask me to their parties. They will never ask me to participate in the things that they do as unbelievers because they know where I stand. I am a Christian. This is who I am. My covenant is with God. And I can't go back. He says, this way no one will ever approach me. And ask me to do things that are wrong. The scripture says, here, this is a guarantee. It was a symbol of the cutting off again of the, of, of the old life of sin, the purifying of one's heart and no dedication to oneself to God. The scripture says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. We can't go back as God's people. God's called us to a new life in Christ.